And let's finish this um, section of my war with the United States, which is called the trip to Mississippi. And this is a good example of where nonfiction shows us kind of the ugly side of what the world used to be like a hundred years ago. This story, or uh, this is a nonfiction account, of course, from 1918. And we're talking about the transport of an African-American prisoner to Mississippi from Buffalo, New York. He is in a straight jacket. He is essentially being force-fed. And our narrator, who is German, is doing this in front of the black train porters. So where we have left off, um, he's paid 75 cents for the police in Cincinnati to watch the prisoner who is not allowed out of a straitjacket while he goes to a party with some girls. We took a trip up a little mountain in the vicinity of the city. It has a cable car, like some mountains in Tyrol, and on top is a museum. At the entrance is a stand. At the entrance of it stand two knights that are copies of the Silver Knight in the Hofkirch in Innsbruck, and they make me feel very far away. Around this hill is much of Cincinnati's beautiful dreck. The dinner is very fine, the dance also. Everybody in this city seems to be German, and at least talk it. They also know Doris and her family in Buffalo. They are brewers. So was my grandfather a brewer. When we drive back to the station, I think of the kitchen gang and how rough they are with their terrible girls. And with this, to strengthen me, I kiss the girl in the car without asking for permission first. And this seems to be the way to do it, because she allows it and holds still and only says it's too bad I have to go. The lieutenant at police headquarters takes me up with a lift to where the patient has been all this while. He says he would gladly pay for having him stay. On one of the upper floors is a large construction-like, a huge bird cage, and in it are lots of people, small crooks and harlots that have been locked up for minor offenses, also peddlers and beggars that come here to keep warm. In this room, the police say, is a continuous deafening noise, and much cursing, whistling, and booing, and many fights, but not since my patient is here. Now it is quiet like a church. For all the time, he has sat on one side of the cage, and they all together, and close as they can get to each other opposite him. They stared at him, and he at them. He must have known that they were afraid, because he rolled his eyes and made faces, also growled. All this time they have been in terror, and when he moved, sliding a few inches, they moved a few inches to keep the most distance between him and themselves. I have a little more time. My patient is fed, but first we have to remove his trousers and clean them. This has happened three times on this trip so far. When they are clean and dried, we are ready to go, the lieutenant said. Off we go, Zane, and gave me back the 75 cents, also some cigarettes, and asked me to stop any time I came to Cincinnati. The coach in which we ride is next to in which we ride next, is filled with noises. It wobbles, and except for the patient and myself, and at times the conductor, who is not inclined to talk, it is completely empty. The train stops frequently. I think it has a wood-burning engine, because after a stop, we always pass a pile of cut timbers. Also, there are at times scrubby forests, but they are irregular, not like the deep forests around Munich and in Tyrol, where each tree stands behind another one in a straight, orderly line, and is tall and even. The trees do not look too healthy, and when a patch is passed, there come again a wide stretch of red land. There comes again a wide stretch of red land. It lies in waves like the sea in a wind that is not yet a storm. Over this landscape the sun sets redder than I have ever seen it, and also twice the size it is in Buffalo. Far apart are houses, shacks of unpainted wood. For some reason the fallen apart ones do not look half so unhappy as the ones that are lived in, with smoke coming out of them. That is because I feel lonesome for whoever has not moved away from there. This scene is again like a melody of violins that play on deep strings. The man without mind that is my patient. 
is in his bundle, so good and quiet, so sad and lost, it seems it would be kindest to shoot him rather this minute than the next, and bury him in his land here, so that he could find release and go back to the earth. There is no civil off there are no civil authorities in Purvis, Mississippi. There is a sawmill on one street with chickens in it and two pigs. On both sides of it are filthy houses and sunflowers. In the houses that are covered with red mud with the red mud and are open to the four winds, people people all colored, animals and many children live together. After looking very close and long at him, they recognize the patient and admit he is one of them. He was well when he left them. Now he is back. He recognizes no one. The people take me to one home, and there is his family. One woman shrieks and weeps. The children stare, and the men look at me with anger. I tell them that he will be better, that this takes time, and that after a while the straitjacket can be taken off him, and then he will be as happy as he was before. They weep and look angry, and I wonder what to do. I cannot leave him here. My orders are to the civil authorities of Purvis. Where are they? The authorities arrive in the shape of a man with a dirty white suit and a sharp, thin face. He has two horses with him, and is some kind of mare or gendarme. He also knows this man, and of me bringing him here. Overnight he will take care of him in a lock-up, and then take him away tomorrow on the next train. The little train on which I have come will be back again. It runs one day to the south, the next to the north, and then stops one day altogether. I must go back with this train. First, we bring the patient to the lockup. Somebody will stay with him through the night, and in the morning, I will feed him and show him how it. I will feed him and show this man, this man how this is done. We also have to take care of his trousers again. His wife is going to wash them, and in the meantime, he has others to wear. Then we ride away. This authority has a big house behind several hills. It has thick-leaved exotic trees and plants. And is weathered, but of and is weathered, but a fine classic design with columns, one of which is missing. I get a room, the biggest I have ever slept in, on one of the upper floors. In the morning, we have a rich breakfast of fried chicken with sweet sauce, and very fine coffee. Then I get a receipt of authority for the patient, and also give him the papers. As it is time for the train, we ride down to the lockup. My patient sits there in the morning sun outside with somebody that is nice and kind, and I think if anywhere in this landscape that he must love as I do Tyrol, he might he might get well. Three strong men are around him, and they are his friends. Now I have to get the straight jacket. I said to the man in authority, you take it off, but he says, oh no, and you are not going to take it off him either. The train whistles, and we have to hurry because I cannot stay here for three days. In Buffalo, the straight jacket is taken out of my pay. It costs $13.50. And that is the end of a trip to Mississippi.